Hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Inference, where we talk about programming languages and other fun stuff. Today, I'm incredibly happy to have here with me, Louis Pitfall. Uh, I, I hope I pronounced this correctly. P Pilfold. Pilfold, I'm sorry. Mm, I, I, <laughs> I also tried before the recording to pronounce the name correctly, and I failed once again. I'm really <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and he's a great engineer. He's working on a, a programming language, and today we will be talking about Gleam, that is a programming language that targets the Erlang VM. And yeah, word to you if you want to present yourself to the audience. Um, yeah, hello. It's, it's really grand to be here. Um, so I'm Louis. I'm a... Uh, sort of, I describe myself as sort of a jack of all trades, freelance software engineer, um, and, and currently I'm working for a uh, video game studio, building some exciting to be open source stuff in Rust, which is um, going to make some waves. But that's not why we're here. We're here to talk about Gleam. So um, I'm the, um, the the the. Uh, the creator, inventor, the designer, whatever. Yeah, we can, we can use the author word, which is amazing. Yeah. But I, I, I made this uh, this language called Gleam, which is a, um, a type safe, massively current, uh, concurrent and scalable language that runs on the Erlang virtual machine. Great. So um, one first question. Um, are you working full time on Gleam or is it a side project? Is it something that you'd like in the future to become your full time work? So I, I, I've been working um sort of quite heavily on gleam since the beginning of 2018 and for maybe about half of that i've been working full time and for the rest of the time i've um you know had a, had a contract and and you know ha had to make some money because we live in a capitalist society so um so I, I i generally do a stint of working and then i work on gleam until like it starts to feel a bit broke and the, uh, all those bills look a bit scary. Okay, I should probably get a job, and then I go back to. to <laughs> yeah. So, so we're cur we're currently in the like I need to I need to make some money phase, um, and then at some point in the future, I'll I'll swing back around and um, do Gleam full time again. Okay, uh, I really wish you to be able uh, to work full time on Gleam because I personally believe that this is a great project and deserves you know all the attention and the care that you can give to that project again. Yeah. So, um, how did the idea of Gleam came in mind first. Uh, I mean, how did it all start? Oh, so um, ooh, how far back do we go? Well, okay, so uh, where, I, I'm very much into Erlang and Elixir, and, and when I first got into um, the Elixir language just after version one was released, I uh, I found myself really missing lots of, of tools that I you know was used to in, in Java, JavaScript and Ruby and these sort of languages. So, for example, I really wish we had a linter. So I made the first um, Elixir linter, which is called Dogma. And I really wish we had a formatter because I thought formatter was really good. So I made, a, I made the first formatter called Xformat. And oh, okay. um, I made, uh, I, I made it not, not quite as impactful. I made a templating language called, um, uh, what did I call it? I can't remember, but it was based off Hamel. Um, and I, I, I sort of, I decided I want these things and I went out and I, you know, read the, the um, equivalents in the other languages and then I started, you know, writing code and eventually I got something. And during this process, I sort of learned a lot about how Elixir worked and I learned a lot about the insides of the compiler because I had to peek under the hood in order to work out how to do the static analysis and stuff like that. Um, and one day I sort of looked at all these projects and I went, these are all compilers, aren't they? So like Dogma is like an Elixir compiler that doesn't actually output anything. It just outputs diagnostics. Yeah. And then, and then I said, oh, well, the X format, that's an Elixir to Elixir compiler. You just compile it back into the same thing, but you, you, you structure it nicely. And um, the templating language is, well, that's, that's passing this templating, um, you know, this template uh, file, and then you output some Elixir code, some optimized Elixir code. Oh, wow, these are all languages. Okay, so I could probably take each one of these bits and merge them together, and I could start making like an actual programming language. That would be really exciting, because I'm a big nerd. I, I love programming <laughs> languages. So, so, so I went, okay, let's see if I can do that. What I actually did is I, I, I submitted a talk to a conference saying, I have written a language in Elixir, um i'll do a talk about it and they accepted it and went okay cool i should probably make this uh i should probably make this compiler then and so i i i screwed away at that and, until i you know had something that worked and that was really exciting and really fun and then i gave the talk and i just sort of discarded it and then i and then over the next year in the back of my mind i was just sort of like gradually thinking about ideas for you know 
what would my perfect language on on the Erlang virtual machine look like? What what would that look like? And then I, I I came to a point when I had just finished working at a place and I was taking a few months off and I said, oh, maybe I should pick up that compiler project again. That would probably be that probably be quite a lot of fun, wouldn't it? And this time I can actually try and make it do more than just like be our language. I could actually make it good. And you know, this sort of snowboard until I had um, you know gleam a, a working language that you know people seem to like which is quite exciting yeah it's it's amazing seriously i've tried to uh, make some tests with gleam before uh, uh you know our uh, our recording and i've been also following the project for uh, for a couple of years uh, i've seen a post on the elixir forum maybe from you uh, mm -hmm. talking about gleam and i was really interested in uh, in the language and in the project so yeah I, i'm quite aware of, uh, you know, how Gleam works. And I really wish to be able to write something in production in the near mm. future or, you know, some open source projects with it, because I, I really believe that it deserves to be, uh, you know, a well-tested language for, uh, from, you know, the Erlang community in general. Well, thank you. And where does the name Gleam come from? Oh, it's really boring. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I needed a cool name and I thought, well, it's, it's got to be, it's got to be, uh, you know, it's got to have some sort of like nice, soft, op optimistic sounding thing, but not have any too strong prior connotations. And it's got to be short and it's got to be easy to spell and not difficult to pronounce. So I literally just picked up the, di the dictionary and I started at A and I just <laughs> okay. read through every word. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got, about, I got towards the end of G and I was like, oh, gleam. There you go. That would do. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that, I'm quite that's happy a with good it. method, actually. Uh, you know, <laughs> if you want to name a variable and you don't know how to name a function or a variable, yeah. just take the uh, dictionary. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> Aardvark and Aaron, yeah. <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> and, uh, okay, going on talking about the language itself, uh, what, what are the greatest advantages of using Gleam instead of Elixir, LFE, or Erlang itself, or mm. other Beam languages? I, I, you know, I want, I want to frame this by saying that I don't, I don't believe that Gleam is about competing with, uh, you know, Elixir or Erlang or LFE or any of the other languages, because, um, you know, I don't think it's a zero sum game. I think if we build more excellent things on the Erlang virtual machine, it's not that I'm stealing Erlang programmers. I'm, I hopefully I'm bringing programmers from other ecosystems or people who've never been programmers before can draw them over to, to you know, to, to make the whole. Um, the beam world even bigger. So that that's kind of the that's kind of the idea. I want it. I want these things to be collaborative. But as to why I think somebody from the outside um, might look at Gleam and say, "Oh, actually, that looks like it's for me," when they looked at Erlang or they looked at Elixir, said, mm, "Yeah, maybe not." Um, the the main one is that all of the all of the big languages on on the beam, as it were. So uh, you know, Elixir, Erlang, and and maybe LFE are probably the biggest ones. Um, they're all very dynamic. Um, you know, they're, they're dynamically typed. You, you've got a yeah. you've, they've, you've got a lot of flexibility in the way that you can use your data structures. Um, and, you know, and they're very permissive in those ways. And so you could write, um, you know, really concise code that does exactly what you want. Um, and the, the language doesn't get in your way so much. But then on the flip side of that, the language doesn't offer you as much help. You know, if, if you were to make a change, it's up to you to work out how to make that change. Like it, it can't offer you as much assistance. And that's really great for a lot of a lot of people. That's really great. That's exactly what they want. But there's a lot of people like me who, who prefer to have assistance from the from the from the compiler, from the from the tooling, from your IDE. I really want, um, you know, to sort of indicate to the computer, well, I want to change this to, to return, you know, a result or a tag tuple, or this could fail, or, you know, I want to return a list of this instead of just one of them. And then I really want the, the computer to show me how, you know, where do I need to alter my code base in order to incorporate those changes? Um, you know, so I want, I want to do sort of like a t a type driven development rather than test driven development okay. or, or REPL driven development. So I think, I think that's really the main draw is that, you know, we can give with Gleam, we can give a different coding experience to what you can get with Elixir Erlang. And once it's in production, it's probably going to be pretty similar. You know, the performance is going to be the same, the way you, the way you introspect is going to be the same. You can use all the same libraries because they're all part of the same wider ecosystem. But it's like, how do you actually interact with the system? How do you interact with code? That's, that's the big draw, I think. Okay, great. Yeah, talking about the type system itself, uh, do you think that adding a type system uh, to a Beam language can add some extra complexity 
when compared to you know uh, Elixir or uh, and any other dynamic programming language? Hmm. Um, I think the answer is yes, but I think it can also detract complexity in other ways. So I think one of the wonderful things about um, dynamic languages is that the amount of things that you have to maybe not know, but the number of things you have to acknowledge or the number of things that you have to touch on if you um, are making a change to something or the number of things you have to learn up front in order to get started with it are much smaller, I think, because you just look at the you just look at like the data structures you've got there and you can make changes. And that, that's kind of it, really. While if you need to learn like a much larger set of rules around a type system, rather, if there's a much larger set of rules of type system, it can be much more challenging to just like step up to the language and start, um, you know, getting things done because, you know, you try something and you know that that's actually OK. You know, so for example, you know, you, you want to take a, an element out of a list and you know that the list has elements in it. So you can take one out and, you know, there's always going to be one to take out. So it's all, it's all fine. And in a dynamic language like Elixir, they go, yep, yeah, that's fine. OK, you know, good. You know, you, you know, that's fine. And it, it will compile and run all that stuff. But in, in Gleam, we'll say, well, hold up. You know, what if what if this list was empty? You know, you need you need to you need to check that this list isn't empty. It's like that's going to be quite bewildering to, to you know, someone who isn't familiar with this stuff because, um, you know, I know that the list isn't empty. Why, why, why do I need to prove that the list isn't empty? Yeah, okay, and that's just it. because the, the type system isn't capable of, you know, the type system isn't as clever as you are. So it can't express everything you can express. And so, like, you just need to be aware of these trade-offs and how to work with these trade-offs up front. But I think then, like, in the long term, you end up with a system that's possibly a lot simpler to work with because um, all of those uh, edge cases you've had to acknowledge up front. So you don't end up with, like, a big ball of edge cases, like, three years of development down the line. Okay, so next question. Uh, why have you started developing that language using Rust instead of Erlang or, you know, hmm. Elixir or other Beam languages? Well, in the beginning, it was written in Erlang <clears throat> long, long ago. Um, and I, I had a working version in Erlang and it, w it was going quite well. And then one day I realized because, you know, like, like any, like any, um, you know, new kind of experimental project, there was a lot of tech there from sort of like, oh, it's going to work this way. Oh, no, that was a mistake. Go back and make changes. And um, the complexity of the system was sort of gradually growing on me. And I came to the point, I came to a realization that I needed to make quite a large refactoring because... Um, something to do with the type, something to do with the type inference um, was limiting me. And I looked at the code and I said, I don't feel confident that I can actually make a refactoring this large in this code base and do it successfully. I, it's because it's such a fundamental change to like the core data structures. I'm really going to have a hard time to do this in a correct way. And I've got quite a lot of tech debt. And in Erlang, I don't really have anything to help me make these changes. Is it going to be easier to just sort of throw away all this tech deck code and take the important bits, which are like the learnings of like how these things should work and try again? And, and you know, m most people say never do, never do a rewrite. But I think in this case, it was <laughs> okay. it was the right thing to do. And it gave me and at that point, it gave me the opportunity to say, OK, well, is Erlang the right tool for the job here? Because I think I think compilers, um, you know, they're, they're all about manipulating abstract syntax trees, these big, these big deeply nested tree structures with lots of different kinds of nodes. And it's like, that to me feels like something that a language like um, Haskell or OCaml or Rust would be a much better, would do much better at than Erlang, which is all about IO and concurrency. And there's no concurrency here and there's no IO. So maybe this, and there's, there's no, there's no faults to be tolerant towards. So like, maybe, maybe this is the right thing. So I, I, um, I did a little exploration in Rust because Rust is a, is a language that I really like and I really admire and I, I, I thought it'd be a good fit. And it went so well, I felt, yes, this is definitely it. So I continued writing in Rust and I ended up with um, a, a code base that was much cleaner and, and much easier to work with. And um, I completed that refactoring, which was fantastic. And, you know, it's, it's not just because Rust is amazing, but it's also because, like, this is version two. <laughs> so, okay. like, you, you, okay. know, you know what you're doing the second time around. Um, but one, one thing that was definitely a, a huge advantage with Rust compared to Erlang is that it was much faster. It was, it was way faster to do this, like, completely CPU-bound thing 
in Rust than it would have been in, in Erlang. And when you're writing tooling, it's annoying to press a button to compile and then wait ages. You know, if you can press a button to compile and it happens immediately, that's, that's a much better user experience. So we, we want to have that as much as possible. What was the biggest difficulty in writing a language? What was the greatest challenge that you encountered? I think the thing that is probably the hardest is actually designing a language that is worthwhile. Like um, you, you've got to make sure you've got to make sure that you've got a clear value statement, and you've got to make sure that um, everything is consistent, and coherent, and fits really well with each other. And um, you know, you've you've got to separate what you personally like or what you personally really enjoy, and what you think would be the best for um, you know the particular use case that you've got. So, as an example, uh, I really like ML languages like Haskell, and the early versions of Gleam had a syntax that was very similar to Haskell. But I quite quickly found that people didn't really like that very much. You know, like, the people who like Haskell love it, but like generally, people don't like it. They look at it and go, oh, "This looks weird. I don't know what this is. This is this doesn't look like a language that I would like." Which is a shame because I want Gleam to be used by everybody. I want every I want people to feel comfortable with this language, and so I experimented with, with using like a, a sort of a more C or Scala or Rust inspired syntax, and the same people who said, "Oh, I don't know about this," went, "Oh, this looks really nice. Oh, I like how this works," and people stopped looking at the "Oh, it looks odd," and they started looking at the "Oh." it works like this that's really cool so that was really that was that was a, an important thing to take on board that we need to um we, we can't always just do what you know we personally want to we need to do what, what makes sense for the wider community or you know for our particular aims um and, and as for how you how you you know make things consistent well it's just a lot of thinking you know sit, sit, sit in the garden you know in, in a deck chair and and you know with, with a glass of lemonade and just think about it for a long time and then eventually everything sort of like slots together hopefully um so i think that is the most difficult bit but the bit i found hardest which is slightly different is that i'm i'm not a i don't have a computer science edge uh background oh, i don't really? i don't have a degree or anything okay. no no i'm I I, so that. my degree was in bio yeah everyone seems really surprised but i don't know any i don't know anything about computers i i was a biologist oh, uh, okay. and then i i um, <laughs> i don't have a computer biology... science degree background too so this is giving me some uh, hope for my future <laughs> oh yes yeah. wonderful so you you can do it uh, both wow. you and, and the, anyone in the audience you know it's not it's it it turns out it's um the problem i had was uh because i never did that compiler you know course at school or university or whatever i just didn't know where to start it's really hard to to you know open google and type in how do i make a programming language and hit enter and you know you just get lots of nonsense you know you get like forum posts from people like me who are very confused or you get at academic papers that are written with some kind of mathematical notation that i don't know what i don't know what it means yeah <laughs> or i, I get understand. um you know i get I, old university course and stuff like that and it's just like oh I, I don't know which is I don't know what's out of date and I don't know what is good and I don't understand most of them um and eventually I, I found um I so I found this book after I learned how to make the language which is a shame but I wish I found it first um this book here uh Understanding Computation by Tom Scott is a really excellent um introduction introduction to like how does code work like what is it doing like how do you how do you talk about actually code as a as a, as a thing and manipulate it um and it's it's very clear and it's very concise and it has lots of examples in ruby and you follow along the examples and you implement a language like three times or something like that it's 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 really fun so i'll, I'll check that out it doesn't cover type systems so much though so oh, okay. if anyone finds a really good book on type systems let me know i've the the, the, the amazing book on type systems is this one oh, oh, can i get that in the shot there you go <laughs> types of program languages okay by by pierce which I is is really good, but really also really difficult to understand if you're if you're like me and don't know anything about maths. So um, yeah, yeah, try it, but do the do the do this one first. Um, 
so yeah it's it's just the material finding the material is really hard like learning how to do it is tricky but once you've learned those things it's surprisingly not actually that complicated well it's surprisingly not that hard it's difficult but it's a thing that any 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 programmer can do if they just put enough time into it i think okay this is giving me a lot of hope uh, i really thank you personally yeah. for, <laughs> for that uh, <laughs> I, uh, have you ever experienced you know a kind of mentorship while you were uh building the language have you ever had uh you know a chance to work with someone else that can you know drive you in the right direction while you were building the let's say the first versions of the language um i i wish i could say that i had that would be lovely there's been a few people who have who have helped me with um sort of language design but i think language design is a is a very different skill to like making a making the language and making a compiler is is very different and that that one i don't know how you learn that one i think you just have to think about languages an awful lot but at, actually mentorship and making compilers i di- i didn't um i didn't have that sadly but i i i would love for other people to um have that and i really want more people to make compilers or to work on the gleam compiler that would be cool oh, so absolutely. um if it, if anyone if anyone would like to get involved in in development of the gleam compiler and you know we can all be noobs together um yeah <laughs> send me a message on discord or something and we can we can get hacking it'd be really fun i think yeah i will definitely send you a message on discord yeah uh you oh wonderful I, i'm sold <laughs> <laughs> yeah and one question that i often uh, ask at the beginning of the episode but uh we haven't covered that part of the episode yet um how did you get in touch mm. with the uh, functional programming and erlang in uh, in particular oh okay so um my f- the first so I only started learning programming when I was in uh, university. So I was a DJ. I was I thought I was so cool. Okay. I like collected records, uh, you know, and I had two turntables and I played I played this really bad dance music and it was really fun. Um, and then one day I discovered this piece of software called Xwax by a chap called Mark Hills. Fantastic man. And it, it's this really amazing piece of open source software that allows you to take an MP3 and a special piece of vinyl. And then when you play the special vinyl that has like a, a computer tone on it, the computer will play the MP3 as if it was on the record. So you could scratch your 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 digital music collection, which was just so cool. It was amazing. So I, I installed, I ruined my computer by installing Linux and I installed this Xbox thing. Um, and then I, I played with it for, for years. It was really good. Um, and at one point I was like, wait, it's, it's this open source thing. And that means that I can, that means I can learn. I mean, that means if I learn programming, I can, I can add features to this DJ thing. So, so I decided to learn C, um, that didn't work obviously. Um, <laughs> and then I sort of bound, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to learn an easier language first. And I learned, I, you know, I did a bit of Python as like, I was I was getting somewhere, but it doesn't really, work. and then I, I started writing some Ruby and that, that felt really good actually. And then I never really got back to the C. Um, so I, I will do that at some point, but I was, anyway, I was writing Ruby and, um, I really loved this, this one module in Ruby called enumerable and it had all these methods in it called fil- like filter and, and reduce and, um, you know, fold map, all these sorts of things. Like, wow, this is really good. Like, what are these things? Like, Someone said to me, I can't remember who it was. This was functional programming. And I went, wow, that sounds really cool. Okay. I'm going to learn whatever that is. And so I Googled functional programming and just started learning Haskell. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, a nice jump. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I really liked it, but I I I um I uh I really liked it. I didn't really get anything done with it. It was sort of one of these things where I would talk about it and then I'd do like little programming exercises, but I would never actually manage to write any programs. And then one uh at this point I had a I was working at a, a Ruby um at some Ruby company and uh, one of my colleagues said, "Hey, you really like Haskell." I've got this book on Elixir, which is a language that's like a, li- a Ruby mixed with Hacks- Haskell. And I was like, wow, that sounds amazing. I was like, do you want to borrow the book? And I was like, yes, I want to borrow the book. And so I, I read that like cover to cover over the course of like two days or something. And I went, this is the best language ever made. It's so cool. And then I just sort of like nothing but Elixir for ages. <laughs> okay. And then I, you know, that, and then I just sort of like spread out. So I was like, oh, I should learn this Erlang thing as well. And so, uh, so yeah, that was, that was my, um, sort of accidental stumbling into functional programming. And I, I feel very lucky because it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. It, 
um, you're not the first person actually telling me that uh, they get into functional programming because of Ruby. And it's funny because, you know, uh, Ruby started as a better Python with more object-oriented features at the beginning and ended uh -huh. up moving many people to functional programming. So <laughs> it's a sort of no sense, but yeah, this is the same for me. I started because of Ruby and then moving to Elixir. So yeah, uh, same thing for me. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny how that works out, eh? <laughs> yeah. And also jumping from Ruby to Haskell, it's a, it's a nice jump. Uh, I guess it... <laughs> wasn't it hasn't <laughs> been easy i guess no I, I i sort of had a i had a folder in which i you know just collected programming challenges so it was all things like given these inputs you know you have to, you have to get these outputs off you go and or i started doing things like trying to re-implement libraries i could find in the world and stuff like that but anything that actually did anything i never worked how to do it i think it's because i was so confused by the what's this io type thing like how do i actually read files and how do i actually like write a web server and how do i do it and I, it's a shame because these days i you know I, I'm, I'm a little bit better at haskell and i know how to do these things so I, oh it wasn't i wasn't actually very far off i think the main thing i didn't have was documentation I think if someone showed me, if, they, if there was a repo that said like, hey, look, here's a repo that has a, um, a web server in it, I probably could have picked that up and, and run with it, you know? If, if there was like a Sinatra for Haskell or Rails okay. for Haskell, I mean, there are, there are a few frameworks, but I mean, I mean more in the way of if there was that body of um, tutorials and documentation and all that sort of things, I think it could go a lot further. So that's really important for, that's one of the reasons I think Elixir succeeded. And it's one of the reasons I hope that Gleam is going to succeed because, you know, yeah, absolutely. Um, tutorial documentation is so important. That's like, it's like the number one thing. Like, how do people come to your language? And I'm that I'm, fi I'm finishing one feature at the moment in Gleam. And then I really want to start focusing very heavily on like making a, you know, really nice onboarding experience with like a great interact interactive tutorials and all those sort of things. Yeah, we will be back on this point uh, during the conclusion for Ooh. this episode. For now, I would Ooh. like to ask you another uh, another thing. Um, we've talked about Ruby, Haskell, uh, which are two completely different languages, which actually mm -hmm. share something in the way we write code. And I've seen um, a talk of you at CodeSync uh, 2019 where at a certain point you're describing the differences between defensive and offensive programming, where I personally mm. believe that Haskell and Ruby and other languages, of course, can be described as, let's say, defensive programming. And okay, so mm. can you please explain the def uh, defensive and offensive programming? Sure, sure. Um, and I, I, think, I, th I think this is one of the, as far as I know, Erlang is the only language that does this well. Erlang-based languages are the only ones that do this well that I know of. But I could be wrong. Um, so d let's start with defensive programming. So the idea of defensive programming is that um, you acknowledge the fact that things can go wrong because no matter how good your code is, um, the universe is not on your side. Um, computers are rubbish. Uh, physics is against you. You know, the, the entropy happens. Your hard drive crashes, or you know, your server gets struck by a bolt of lightning, or some someone drags their feet across the carpet and builds up a static charge and like zaps the computer, flicking some bits from one to zero. Something goes wrong, and and you know, errors are going to happen. Defensive programming is the idea that, you know, before you can do anything, you just have to quickly check and make sure everything is in the state it should be. So like, oh, I've been given a pointer to a thing. Oh, let's just quickly check that it isn't a null pointer. Are you a null pointer? No, you're not a null pointer. All right, now we can go. Which is which is great because like you're acknowledging the fact that uh, things can go wrong and you have to do something about that. It's not so great because your code is like one line of business logic and three lines of if this is a null pointer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Retur return an error. Log. Do something. I don't know. Okay. Move on to the next thing. And it it gets re it gets quite um it gets it, it gets quite repetitive and quite verbose and it's very frustrating. In the Erlang world, they say no, don't do defensive programming. Do offensive programming. So so what is offensive programming? Um. So rather than saying, oh, is this you know did did that last thing succeed? Did something go wrong? Uh, no, it didn't go wrong. Okay, let's continue. They say, that previous thing definitely succeeded. It definitely didn't go wrong. And then, and then it carries on. And if it turns out that it did go wrong, when you were making that assertion that, that, that um, uh, when you're making that assertion that it definitely didn't go wrong, the programmer says, oh no, something's going horribly wrong, and it crashes. 
okay. which in most languages would be awful. Most languages that'd be really awful. But in Erlang, the idea of, of, of crashing and acknowledging the fact that things are going to crash, things are going to go wrong and explode is built into your program. So um, rather than having all of this sort of local error handling, so you say, say like, if this went wrong, handle the error here. You say, it definitely didn't go wrong. We could just continue. And then somewhere else, much higher up your higher up in your program, you effectively have like a checkpoint and you say, OK, from here down, if anything goes wrong, here's how we restart and try again or here's how we handle the error. And so you define things at a much higher level. And so you and so I think um, in practice, you really want kind of a mix of both like offensive and, and defensive programming because and, and I think it comes down to um, how you categorize errors. So if a few examples if a if a user if if you are writing a, a a web service that people type in some people type in some uh, i don't know their credit card details and sends it to you and you like place a payment and you share the thing saying congratulations you just bought our book or something um if they could give you invalid credit card number right and in which case the the transaction is going to fail because those those details aren't correct. Well, you really don't want to use offensive programming here because if every time someone makes a typo typing in the credit card number, your web server crashes, you're going to have a terrible experience. And he's just like, oh, I've just, I've just typed in, I've just tried to buy a book and it says like 500 internal server error. Oh, what is, oh, have I been, have my, has my credit card been <laughs> stolen? What's going on? Some, something's gone horribly wrong. I, I'll never buy anything from this store ever again. <laughs> Got it. So yeah. you, don't, you don't want to do offensive programming. There. That's, a, that's an awful idea. You want to do defensive programming. You want to say like, you know, try and place the, try and, try and, uh, place the payment. Did it succeed? No, it didn't. Okay, well, I'll let the user know. And, and that's because that is an expected error that's within, it, within your domain. A, a different example, say you're writing a, like a cache and that cache writes to the file system, you know, so like got some data, I'll just quickly open a file, write it to the file and then just carry on. So you expect um, always to be able to write to files on the file system. And if you can't, something has gone horribly wrong. Like something is seriously wrong with your computer if you can't write files. So like, okay, uh, we're not going to do defensive programming because, well, what can you actually do when you can't write to files anymore? Like th there is nothing reasonable you can do. This, this is a place to be offensive. You say, I assert that I can definitely write to a file and I'm going to continue on with, with, you know, my code. And then you don't write all this, um, you know, super verbose error handling logic. You just write the things you want to do and then move on. So that, that's sort of like my, that's a short of short and hopefully somewhat understandable, um, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. explanation of my theory on, 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 on offensive and defensive programming. Now, and I'll say like, you, you said that R Ruby is, um, defensive. I'm not sure I'd agree when oh, okay. maybe it's just me when I was writing Ruby, but I always felt that it was more like YOLO programming because like, okay. they saw, <laughs> we, we never really checked that we never really checked if the errors occurred or not. We just sort of hoped they wouldn't. And if they did happen, everything just went wrong. Like there wasn't any special error handling mechanism or fault tolerance. Just like, yeah, it should work. Maybe it was just me, you know, maybe, I, maybe I'm being quite <laughs> okay. harsh on the Ruby community. I don't probably, have, probably just me. Yeah, I don't have memories of me writing that kind of Ruby, but maybe I was writing <laughs> wrong. Uh, for sure, I was writing <laughs> wrong Ruby all the time. <laughs> and okay, I personally think that, you know, um, being able to choose between offensive and defensive programming, uh, given the reliability of the Erlang virtual machine, it's another selling point for the Gleam programming language that was <laughs> Uh, the mm. reason why I asked you, yeah. So I think I think the, one of the things that Gleam brings to so I think I think Erl, I think Erlang and Elixir X are, are really well tooled for offensive programming. They, they they do fantastic, but I think they do um, worse than some other language, languages do for defensive programming. And I think the reason for that is um, it's not always obvious in Elixir and Erlang when something can fail you know if something fail when something crashes and you rely on the fault tolerant properties you know you always have to ask that question is was that intentional did you mean to be offensive or did you just forget to be defensive because you look at the function and you can't tell if it sometimes returns an error or not while in gleam all of the error handling is encoded into the type system so um the programmer always knows when an error is returned, so you always have to explicitly handle it. So it, it's not possible to accidentally, you know, accidentally mishandle an error. You, it's always it's done explicitly. So that that's one of the things I think is sort of beneficial to to glean there. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
And okay, um, moving to the conclusion for this episode, uh, are you currently looking for uh, maintainers or people joining the project on the technical side or, you know, helping for documentation, uh, websites, advocacy, whatever? What, what are you looking for? Or who are uh, you looking yes, for? Yes, all, all, all of those, please. Those all sound absolutely wonderful. So... Um... The, the 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 biggest goal really is just to get more people trying out gleam and you know if if they find it really works for them and they want to write more of it that's brilliant we've got a new member of the community if if they if it doesn't work for them um i'd love to hear you know what were the pain points you know what what were the things that were difficult that would be, that would be really great um because you know with that information we can learn more about like w what works for people what doesn't and maybe they really like the language but like the documentation's rubbish or they found the um, the tooling confusing or something like that all these are really useful things um and you know i i really hope that they do like it and then they join the community and then they can you know people can start doing things like um you know, if you want to write libraries for other people to use, that would be really cool because, you know, we've got lots of Erlang and Elixir libraries that we can use, but it'd be really cool to have like dedicated Gleam ones. Even just like writing some Gleam code and putting it on GitHub, even if it's not really for anyone else to use or it's not really, you know, useful, that's still great. That's still really, that's still really cool because then other people can see that you're working on Gleam and, you know, we can sort of take little learnings from like, oh, that's interesting. They do these things. That's kind of neat. Um, and, it, and it's always just nice to see people use something you've been working on for a long time. Now, if you want to be, if you are the kind of person who would be interested in in working on, you know, the Gleam project, uh, as it were, I try and make it so that the issue tracker is, is you know, well stocked, full of full of uh, problems. No, well, well stocked, full of tickets that people can pick up. And, I, and I've tried to categorize them all. So we've got um, we've got labels on each of them saying if we think this is a good beginner friendly one, um, if this is a good first issue, um, if this one is about web dev, if this one's about the website, if this one's about type systems, if this one's about, um, you know, compilers, tooling, whatever, Erlang. Um, so hopefully people can find something that they that they find interesting. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be something that you are an expert on. You may be a web developer. Uh, so you feel like, oh, maybe I could do some web developer tickets. But like, if you would find working on the type system more interesting, or you want to learn about that, hey, get in touch, you know, and I'll give you some pointers and we can, you know, d hack on the type system. That'd be really cool. Like, it's an open source project, you know. Um, uh, I, I'm I'm being sponsored by, the by you know, members of the community, which is incredibly, you know, uh, wonderful. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, but fundamentally, you know, it, it isn't much money and other than me, no one's getting paid. So it's got to be fun. It, it, if you don't, you know, if you can come to Gleam and enjoy it and have a good time, that's really awesome. If you don't enjoy it, well, do something else, you know, have fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, please, please do get involved or just to drop by our Discord. Oh, okay. That was my next point. Uh, where can people reach out ah. to you other than uh, GitHub? I mean, um, I've seen that you have a Discord channel and I think that there is something on exorcism, right? Mm, yes. So, oh, yes. Okay. So, um, so there's a few places that you can get it, get involved with the, the Gleam project. So there is the community discord. We switched over IRC at the beginning of the year and it's been wonderful. So many people have joined, uh, you know, the, the IRC was like very slowly growing, but as soon as we should have Discord, loads of people joined and there's been loads of really interesting discussions and people sharing things and asking questions. And it's been really fantastic and really fun. And I wish I did. I wish I did it a year ago. Uh, so it's, been, you know, please do get involved in that. If you want to just talk on GitHub issues about, you know, about some things to work on or problems you've had, that's also really good. That's a really useful way of, of interacting the project. If you just want to keep up to date with um, releases and stuff, you could follow the project on GitHub and give us a star as well. Um, or you could uh, follow the Gleamlang account on Twitter, which I normally share, um, you know, releases on there and any articles or blog posts or talks and stuff that get get done on Gleam. Uh, and if you wanna, if you would like Gleam, but also pictures of my cat and me being very grumpy about politics, you could follow my personal Twitter as well. So there's, lo there's <laughs> lots of different ways you could uh, follow along with the, the project, depending on exactly what flavor of interaction you're interested in. Okay, great. So one last question before closing uh, for today. Um, what are your thoughts about the future of Gleam? Gleam's come so much further than I, you know, three, four years ago, I would have 
dared think that it could possibly go and it's really exciting we've now got a you know an actual language that works you know it's a real thing that people there there are there are multiple companies using gleam in production which i find that just absolutely uh humbling and and really exciting and i i hope that this this trend continues and it looks like it's going to uh, and so the core language is pretty stable and usable. Um, we just have, it's all about improving the experience and making the developers more productive using Gleam now. So for, from my point of view, this is all about building um, better tooling, um, you know, integrating better with Mix, integrating better with Rebar, possibly exploring a custom build tool just for Gleam. I don't know. Build it, you know, building excellent documentation. I really want to make an interactive tutorial inspired by the one that Go has or the one that the Svelte framework has in the JavaScript world. Um, so people can go, oh, I'm interested in Gleam. I will, you know, go to try.gleam.run or, you know, go to the website and um, suddenly you're in an editor where you can run and compile Gleam and it takes you step by step through how to how to learn it. That's such a powerful thing and not have to make anyone commit to installing Erlang on the computer and then installing Gleam and then installing Rebar and then making a project. You know, none of that nonsense. You just type code in and off you go. So that, that'd be really, really great. And um, then I, uh, after that, who, not sure, but I would like to also have... Um, I'd like to also have uh, the language server protocol implemented so we can have like an IDE like experience inside all the editors. So you can be a Vim user or an Emacs user or a VS code user, but you can have all of those lovely things like, you know, uh, see all the types inside your editor, uh, perform refactorings, um, get error messages in line, um, jump to definition, peak definition, all, all, all that good stuff. So, you know, we want to have the same world-class editing experience that people have come to expect with modern day programming languages. Uh, uh, one last thing, because you mentioned it, exorcism. I uh, really want, we have an exorcism track, but it isn't finished yet. Well, they're never finished, but it, it hasn't been launched yet because there aren't enough, um, uh, we haven't we haven't written enough exercises. We haven't got enough exorcism exercises on, on the, on exorcism. That's got us a complicated sentence um and i thought i thought i was going to do this but i think i've accepted that um i don't have enough time to to make an exorcism track as well as all the other things so um if somebody wants to to have a go at that that, that could be a fun project for someone okay awesome i leave some links into the description for this video so if anyone wants to get more involved into the clean project can definitely go into the description field for this video and you know Go whatever they want. Go to the GitHub, to you know, uh, Twitter, and so on, so it can get you know up to date with the Gleam language. And I personally want to thank you again, Louis, for being here today. It was a pleasure to me to talk with you, and I really wish you to achieve many goals with that language uh, because it's absolutely amazing. Thank you again. Thank you. That you, you've been in incredibly kind, and um, yeah, thank you for inviting me on the show. And if I might be a bit cheeky, I'd also just like to quickly plug the the um, uh, the Gleam GitHub sponsors program. So if if you really if you really really like Gleam, or if your employer really likes Gleam, please consider sponsoring the project on GitHub sponsors. Just a like just a few dollars makes all the difference, and hopefully I can spend more time working full time on Gleam. Absolutely. So thank you again, Louis. I really hope to see you again in a future episode. Uh, yeah. So see you next time. We'll see you next time.